fathers of nations chapter 7 before the summit opened its host thought he might break the ice by going from guest to guest and engaging each in friendly banter first he began with the president of nigeria he got this right there is a political hierarchy nobody talks about it publicly those low in the hierarchy would take offense if anybody did so but it would not be any clearer if everybody talked about it publicly it rests on the four poles of influence one of those poles of influence is pure power the ability of countries to impose their will on all who oppose them more precisely it is a fear of them who might oppose that those countries would impose their direct will on them if they opposed Population is another pole of influence, true. It was less pivotal in the era of the summit than it had been centuries before, when strengths of armies were measured in the numbers of soldiers and therefore depended on the size of the population. But to this day, it counts. Nobody takes on China, for example. Similarly, in Africa, no one takes on Nigeria. Again, population is a reason. Every fifth African is a Nigerian. So no African snubs Nigeria or its president. This was why, before the summit opened, its host skipped other presidents and went to exchange pleasantries with the president of Nigeria first. He had to show that the premier status of Nigeria was neither in question nor in doubt. Thrilled by this recognition, the Nigerian president a ripe 70 years old and full general, if now retired, stood up from his seat and gave his host a broad smile, followed by a warm hug. Host and guest then chatted like brothers. Indeed, twice each called the other his brother's president, thereby revealing a personal secret they shared. They were born presidents. Seated in the back row, among the observers was Pastor Chiamaka. The summit's interaction to him, to him was as an observer were not only firm and clear, but also rude and insulting. Watch the summit, but don't interfere, ever. Therefore, he was just watching, not intervening. The Nigerian president, he concluded reluctantly, looked more majestic in those sky blue robes that he was wearing than his Gambian counterpart in his rows of white curtain. If only the man could do Nigeria well, Pastor Chiamaka thought to himself. Another pole of influence is technology. Nobody picks on America. The reason is not the size of its army, but the capacity of its technology. Likewise, in Africa, nobody picks on South Africa. Its technology is nowhere near that of America, but in Africa, its technology is second to none. For this reason, as soon as the summit's host had finished humoring Nigeria's head of state, he went to humor South Africa's president. Still another pole of influence is a simple alliance with one or more of the other poles. Nobody bullies Kenya, for example. This is not because it is a pole itself, but because some of its friends are poles. Right from the day it won its independence, it very wisely became and to this day remains America's best ally in black Africa. For that reason, no country bullies this chosen one. To try to do so is to risk reprisals by its powerful friend. The summit offered ample proof of that. After greeting South Africa's head of state, its host went to greet the president of Kenya next. The Kenyan leader stood up, acknowledged his recognition during the small talk that ensued, this country's failed wildlife came up somehow. Before long, the Kenyan president was inviting his host to his country for a state visit. Why not? Contrary to claims by smooth-talking bureaucrats in Ministry of Foreign Affairs notwithstanding, watching the president of Kenya from a seat at the back of the hall was Professor Kimani. His daughter, Tunu, had died in a public accident under a truck trailer some law of physics had thrown at her. Then his wife, Asiya, had run off with a randy member of parliament already, husband to three. 
this loser, this law losses had since hardened into grudge, given the avoidable nature of their causes, were they not losses that the Kenyan government could have prevented but had not? Yet another influence of a poll is sheer obstinacy. This is a poll so thorny that few heads of state dare to praise it openly. Put simply, it is the habit of engaging in needless fights with enemies and friends alike. Zimbabwe's ruler had bags of it. Once at a well-attended General Assembly of the United States, the man had walked up to the microphone and rebuked America and Britain loudly in spite of, in spite of the devastation they could have rained on him before he got back to his seat somehow. Something else also happened on that day. In the eyes of the world, the prestige of this son of Zimbabwe rose. Through sheer obstinacy, he had dared to say publicly what not many would have dared to say publicly. It was not surprising then that when the host finished greeting Kenyan's president, he hurriedly went to his son of Zimbabwe next. The man had endured so many rude questions about his reign over Zimbabwe that now he answered them even before they were asked. Such was the case here too. Zimbabwe's economy was on demand. Answered he before his host asked. Detractors who said otherwise, he added, were but liars in the pay of evil masters or traitors who deserved to hang and one day would. Comrade Malusi, scowling at the man from a seat in a back row, hated him intensely. Zimbabwe's fifth brigade had murdered hundreds of people, including his wife. Had the man not set the brigade loose on them, bulldozers had driven thousands of Zimbabweans out of their homes into wild lands. Had the self same man not given the order? After years of misrule, Zimbabwe now was back in the Stone Age. Had the man not taken it there? Where everybody else exercises power within agreed rules, the simple refusal to abide by those rules is another pole of influence. No one understood this truth better than did the leader of Libya. Later, he would disown it, but before he did, it was his tool of choice. He used it when a bomb planted by his followers blew up a pan-American wild airlines plane over Scotland, killing 300. Agreed on rules required him to surrender the bomb planters for trial and to pay compensation to the families of their victims. The man refused to. Perhaps it was to buy off such lawlessness that the summit's host went on to greet him next. The man, mellower now than in the early days, exuded little of the manners that once had radiated from his every pore. His eyes still flashed flares of the iron will that yet flamed in his soul. When annoyed, he turned wild. This was understandable, if not desirable. When he was amused, he also turned wild. This was not understandable. Studying him from the back of the hall was engineer Tahir. Once, he had been one of the man's greatest admirers. Not anymore. The man he once now convinced had sold out to the West and become its servant. The man he used to snap at the wheat's heel like a terrier. But now, he was a poodle, happiest when seated on the whelp's lap. Worst of all, the man had abolished Libya's nuclear weapon program. How would he have failed to see, marveled Engineer Tahir, that by so doing he was throwing away the country's only insurance against future Western attacks and signing his own death warrant? In the bargain, 